everyone, and welcome to Humble Beginnings Ministries. I am your host, Pastor Stephen Woods, and today I want to talk about a passage of Scripture found in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And normally I don't do this, but since I've been talking to many people about salvation and grace, I thought that it would be something special to go ahead and utilize one of the study tool websites that I like to use is BibleReference.com. I don't uh, get any money or support from them for promoting them, but that's besides the point. That's irrelevant. I like the site because I like how you're able to, it just helps you in your studies. It's got a lot of resources. It's got, as you can see, multiple verses on uh or translations rather, it's got ESV, NIV, NASB. I'm not sure which one you prefer, but it's good to see, take a look at different multiple translations when you're studying a certain passage of scripture. With that being said, I'd like to talk to you on the subject of playing games with grace. A lot of times, depending on your background, which plays a big role in your understanding of God's grace. For example, I know that there are people that I'm affiliated with that are in extremely legalistic circles. Uh, by that, by legalistic, I mean from the standpoint of they'll judge you for what you wear, what you don't wear, where you go and where you don't go, whether you drink, whether you smoke, all these things. And they'll tell you, well, you're not saved if you smoke a cigarette or you're not saved if you drink wine. You're not saved if you go, if you don't pay your tithes, all these kind of things that um, is wrapped up in the law. And the sad part of that is they believe that their salvation is based upon works, but they will tell you that they believe that it's based upon faith in Christ. And then you have those who are the far left of the spectrum. These are people who are professors of salvation. What do you mean by that? Well, they say they love Christ or they say that they're saved. I won't say that they say they love Christ because that's a total different sermon for another day. But those who are on the far left are antinomian. They believe in easy believism. Well, I said the prayer. I'm good to go. I'm, I'm ready for heaven, but I'm not going to follow Jesus. That right there is deadly. It's not the gospel. Jesus says, if any man come after me, he must do what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow after me every day. That doesn't sound like a one and done type deal. But a lot of them who are in that camp will say, well, you know what? You just understand salvation wrong. All you, all you have to do is believe. That's the only requirement is believe. But the Bible tells us, do you believe in God? You do well. The devil also believes and he trembles. A really good, well-respected man that I was um, discipled with that I spent time in small group he said the following. He said, a faith that has not changed you is a faith that has not saved you. I'll say it again. A faith that has not say changed you is a faith that has not saved you. That's powerful. What, all, what does that all mean? If you say that you've come to Christ by faith and you're not changed or made brand new or are not growing in sanctification before the Lord, then it's obvious there's no salvation. Some people say, who are you to judge? Who are you to say that who is saved and who's not? Who died and made you God? The answer to that is no one. But Jesus my Lord and my master says, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. I know that's hard for a lot of people to stomach, but again, it's a fact 
of the truth of the gospel, the truth of the word of God. What does Romans 6.1 mean? Again, we're in BibleReference.com, BibleREF.com, Romans chapter 6. It says, what does Romans 6.1 mean? Like I said in the beginning of this video, what I like about this particular layout is that it helps you when you're doing your study. Notice how it gives a question. And then it goes from that to the context summary. Now, why is the context summary so important? Because it helps us to understand the author's intent. If you don't understand the author's intent, then you're not going to get an understanding and be able to rightly divide the word of truth. Take, for example, the following illustration. A man opens up his Bible and he reads a passage of scripture. It says the following, and Judas hung himself. He closes the Bible, opens it back up. He opens it to the passage that says, that what you're going to do, do quickly. Okay. So then the man goes and does it. Should we be that willy-nilly with the scripture? No. Why? Because like the man that read those two verses, he believed God told him to go hang himself. What am I trying to get at? When you don't understand the author's intent, you will, your practice, the way you live your life, will be wrong. You'll understand God. You will understand God wrong, and it could lead to your own personal demise. Okay, let's dive in here. Uh, I'll follow the format of the website just to show you why I like it, and we'll continue on in our study here. Paul begins Romans chapter 6, verse 1, by posing a question about the implications of the statements that ended chapter 5. There he wrote that where sin increased, God's grace super increased. That is, as sin increased, so did God's grace abound to cover the sin of all those who trusted in Christ's death to cover their sin. We literally cannot out -sin the grace of God. I don't know about you. That's good news. <clears throat> it's good news, not so that we can keep on sinning. Or rather, it's good news because it lets us know that God has our past, our present, and our future sin all covered. At the, at the cross of Calvary, your and my sins were completely covered by Christ. The book of Hebrews talks about it multiple times that he died, Jesus Christ died once and for all. And the sacrifices under the Old Testament had to happen all the time. They were repeated sacrifices. And you know what? They didn't erase sin. They didn't deal with sin to the point of complete cleansing. And not only that, but the ones that offered the sacrifices they too needed forgiveness and cleansing. So the Old Testament sacrificial system was a foreshadowing of what was to come in Christ, that he would offer, be the one to offer the sacrifice, as well as be the sacrifice for our sin. Amen. Now, when many people hear that, terminology that we cannot out -sin the grace of God. They will take it, just like in Paul's day, that Paul is saying, sin freely, grace is a license to sin. Hence our title today, Playing Games with Grace, because you have so many out there today who do just that. They play great games with the grace of God. I can do whatever I want to do. I can 
sin however I want to sin and still be all right with God. That's not what God's called us to. It's true that when we do sin, we can be forgiven and cleansed. What do you mean? First John 1 and 9. We have an advocate of the Father, Jesus Christ. When we repent of our sins, he is faithful and just enough to forgive us and to what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So, let's continually continue in our study. What does it mean, though, for those who it mean, though, for those who have been reconciled to God through faith in Christ? What are Christians supposed to do about sin now that we are Christians? Asked Paul. Here, as Paul asks here, should we keep on sinning so that God's grace can just keep increasing? This seems to have a common criticism of Paul's teaching, as it is one he refutes often in his writings. Romans 3 and 8, And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, Their condemnation is just. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In Galatians 5, 19-24. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So, it's a frequent charge against Christianity even today, suggesting that the gospel is really just a license to sin. In the following verse, Paul will answer this slanderous charge with an emphatic no. So, shall we continue in sin? No. That grace may abound? Absolutely not. Let's go to verse 2. By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Oh, there we go. So, let's look at the context summary. Romans 6, 1 through 14 explores how Christians should think about and respond to sin now that we are in Christ and our sins are forgiven. In explaining this, Paul reveals new information about what happened when we put our faith in Christ. In a spiritual sense, we died with him and to our sin. We are then resurrected to a new spiritual life. Now Paul instructs us to continue remembering that we are no longer slaves to sin. We must offer our bodies to be used. We must not offer our bodies to be used for sin, but we must offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness instead. And then... To further our time in this study, I'd like to turn your attention to, to the chapter summary. In Romans 6, Paul answers the question of whether Christians should continue to sin. His answer is emphatic, we should absolutely not. First, when we came to God by faith in Jesus, we died to sin. We are not slaves to it anymore. Second, what we did living, what did living for sin ever get us? It led to shame and death. The righteousness given to us for free by God in Christ, Jesus leads us to becoming like Jesus and to eternal life. 
we should serve righteousness instead of sin. So, as a believer in Christ Jesus, and we talked about it earlier, you have those who are to the far left, they're antinomian. You can do whatever you want, live however you want, and you're still going to inherit eternal life. Why? Because you believe in Jesus Christ. That's easy believism. Then you got the far right that says, you must keep the law and do everything in it. Otherwise, you can't be saved. Rules and regulations. And it might not be that cut and dry. It could be if you don't fast twice a week, if you don't give tithes, if you don't do this, that, whatever the stipulation is, whatever this or that is in your life that you use as a measuring stick. Maybe it's pray 10 minutes a day. Maybe it's your early morning devotional, whatever. And you measure your relationship with Christ based on that. And so when you're not doing so well, well, I'm not sure if I'm really saved. And that's not the way to live. There is a balanced view, a biblical view of salvation, which is that when you come to Christ, you live the spirit-filled life. You have your mind renewed and you remind yourself. Paul is dealing with the charge that, well, if we're saved by faith, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And it has nothing to do with works, and all we got to do is believe, then we can live however we want to live. And Paul says, absolutely not. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not giving you a license to sin. And you who may be tuned in, and you're watching, and you're listening, the Bible is not giving you an excuse for your sin. It's saying that when you came to Christ, you died to sin. The old you has passed away. The new you is being transformed from faith to faith and glory to glory. You are to no longer live in sin. Why? Because in Christ, you are dead to sin. You have taken on a new identity. When Jesus Christ came to the earth, He came and lived the perfect life that you and I could not live. He went to the cross and he paid for the penalty of our sin, the punishment. He offered himself as that sacrifice. He was the priest and the offering. And not only did he bear the penalty of our sin, which led to his death. When he died, he didn't stay in the ground. He rose again for our justification. But I want to take a look at the cross for a moment. At the cross of Calvary, Jesus paid for our sin. He was crucified. He bore the punishment of our sin. He broke the power of sin. And one day, we will no longer have to be in the presence of sin. It's all been de dealt with at the cross. So he, those that repent, those that believe in Jesus Christ, that by him going to the cross, he went for you. Why? Because you believe that the word of God is true, that you are a sinner in need of salvation. That when Christ died, he died and bore your sin. And so when you come to God and you agree that you are a sinner, and that you sinned against the holy God, and that Jesus going to the cross was 
for you on your behalf, and you trust in him and him alone for your salvation, and you repent before a holy God, you ask him to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He raises you from the dead, allowing you to repent and to believe. And then you are made a new creation in Jesus Christ. What that means is that the cross for you means that Jesus took the punishment that you deserved on that cross and he bore it for you. When It also means that when Jesus lived that perfect life, that righteousness, it has been given to you by faith in him. He is, when you repent, you have then be, become forgiven and declared righteous. That the theological term is justified before God. He no longer sees you as who you once were as a sinner. He sees you righteous in Christ. He sees you holy. You are now adopted. You're a child of his. Jesus is your Lord, your Savior, your eldest brother. He obeyed the Father 100% for you and I. He was without sin. And you know what? When he went into that ground, you went into that ground too. When he died, you died. But it gets better. When he rose, you rose along with him. And that is now the spirit-filled life. He raises you from the dead. He allows you to repent. He allows you to trust in him. And he gives you the Holy Spirit. That's the beginning of Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2. Paul is saying, you now have to understand your position in Christ. Keep reminding yourself, you are no longer dead to sin. You are now dead to sin. You're not alive to sin, any, sin anymore. You don't do those sinful things that you would once do. Sin is no longer your master. Sin no longer reigns like a king over your life. You have a new king whose kingdom is righteousness. The old king was sin. Sin reigned. But now the new king has come. The Bible says he's translated us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. You are now operating under new, a new kingdom with a new king who reigns in righteousness. And one day, you and I will enjoy his eternal reign when he reigns forever in righteousness and true holiness, the very presence of sin will be no more. That's good news. That's the good news of the gospel. And for all those that are listening in today, God doesn't want us to play games. And maybe you are those that are on the far left side of the thing of, of the spectrum. You said, well, you might be saying, well, I, I said this in this prayer in 1981. I'm 60 years old. I thought I was saved. But you never understood this truth. Just because you say the sinner's prayer, it's like anything. Just because you pray the Our Father doesn't mean that you've prayed the right way before God. It doesn't mean that you're justified before God. Salvation is of the Lord. It's an inward work that works on the outside of us. It's the Holy Spirit at work in our hearts. Our hearts are purified by faith in Christ. And we no longer live as slaves of sin. Because 
as we go into verse 3, listen what the, the Bible says. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Again, he wanted them to know. Paul wanted the church to know exactly what happened at the cross. That just because Jesus died, and just because you believe in him, doesn't mean that you are saved. It's not a matter of just believing the facts, that he came, he lived, he died, and was buried, and rose again. It is a wholehearted trust. It comes by faith as an act of the grace of God. Where Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 tell us, For you've been saved by grace through faith, not of works. At least any man should boast. It's the gift of God. For you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. And we'll get into that a little bit. But I want you to see here. It's not about easy believism. And it's not about keeping a whole bunch of stringent rules. Paul wants the Romans to understand grace is not a license to sin. Grace means you've been forgiven of your sin. You've been made righteous. You've been made holy. And this is how God has done it. When you were baptized into Christ Jesus, you were baptized into his death. When he died, you died. Let's see what the Bible reference commentator will say. He says, Paul asked if Christians ask if Christians, those who have received God's free gift of forgiveness of our sin through faith in Christ should keep sinning. No, we should not, he has responded. He poses a counter question to explain why. Can those who have died to sin keep living in sin? His implied answer again is no. What does it mean that we have died to sin, though? Part of the answer is found in the question of this verse. All of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. So, Paul does not seem to be talking about water baptism here. From the context of the chapter, we take him to mean a kind of baptism that happens when the Holy Spirit comes into a person at the time he or she becomes a Christian. In that spirit baptism, a new believer is spiritually baptized into Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So we're baptized into Christ Jesus, baptized into his death. We've got the Holy Spirit, right? So that baptism is being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He says we enter into Christ's identity in a sense, becoming so clearly attached to him that God gives us credit for Christ's righteousness, and accepts Christ's payment for our sin. Again, we talked about that earlier. That's the power of the gospel. Jesus offers his life. Jesus offers his life. His all of, he lives a holy life, an obedient life, obeying the Father, even unto death. By offering himself as a payment for our sin, right? And those who repent and trust in him, God gives that righteousness. As Christ gives himself as the payment, as the sacrifice for our sin, God then says, okay, all those that repent and trust in Christ, my son, I will give my righteousness to to all those that believe in him. And that baptism places us, our whole self, in Christ. Water baptism, on the other hand, is an outward sign of that spirit baptism. 
For those who practice believer's baptism, it is a public declaration to the world around us that we belong to Christ and to belong with all the others who belong to him as well. In Acts 10, 48 says, While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even unto the Gentiles. For they were heading, they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So then Paul here says here that when a person trusts in Christ for salvation, that person is baptized in the Holy Spirit into Christ's death. We die with him. This death somehow breaks sin's rule over us and frees us from our need to obey our sinful desires. I want to repeat that one more time. This death breaks sin's rule over us and frees us from our need to obey our sinful desires. Those urges do not entirely vanish, however. Okay. Yes, Christ dealt with sin at the cross. But if he was to deal with our sin in its entirety, and what I mean by that, his sacrifice was more than enough. It was once and for all. But if he wanted to do so and he didn't, he could have killed us. As soon as all those that repent and believe, oh, okay, they repent and believe. Now it's time for them to leave the earth. Nope, he doesn't do that. That explains why Christians still sin. Why? Because, listen again, this death somehow breaks sin rule, sin's rule over us and frees us from our need to obey our sinful desires. Those urges do not entirely vanish, however. So, yes, Christ went to the cross. Yes, he paid the price. Yes, he, God gives us the righteousness of Christ. But he frees us from the need to obey our sinful desires. But that does not mean that we will not be tempted. That does not mean that we won't be, that we won't have any urges. No, the urges don't go away, but their power over us does. We're no longer a tyrant to that master anymore. We're no longer slaves to our sinful desires. We're no longer slaves to the world, the flesh, and the devil. We have a new nature now. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So there's no need to play games with the grace of God. We've been baptized into Christ Jesus. Our identity is found in him, not in the keeping of the law, like those who are on the extreme. Or though, and it's not about just only believing in Christ. So that we can do whatever we want, because then we're making God out to be a liar. If you go living your life however you want to live, then you're still seeing the need to obey your sinful desires. Your sinful desires are still ruling over you. But when you are born again, blood washed, filled with the Spirit of God, you will seek to please you. You have a new desire, and it's holy desires, and it comes from within. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that the flesh wars against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh so that you won't want to do the, the things that you want to do. So you won't do the evil things that you want to do. There are those urges that are there, but they don't have the power that they once had. And as we grow in sanctification before the Lord, we will find ourselves growing and being conformed into the image of Christ. So I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. I've been forgiven. I've been redeemed. I've been set free. 
So what do I do with this grace? What do I do? I begin to read the scriptures and get an understanding of who I am in Christ. And it's through that understanding that I begin to walk in victory over sin. That I don't have to give in to sinful urges. I don't have to, as a Christian, participate in pornography. I don't have to be participate in homosexuality. I don't have to participate in adultery, lying, manipulation, anger issues. I don't have to give in to those urges. I don't have to give in to the urges of overeating. I don't have to give in to urges of overindulging in lustful passions and desires. I don't have to. I'm no longer a slave to those things. Why? Because Christ has set me free from that. And I'm, he doesn't leave us to ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us, giving us power over sin's rule. We are free. We are no longer in chains. We are no longer enslaved. Does that mean we won't be tempted? No. But what it does mean is we do have the power to overcome. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. You can have victory over anything. It's a matter of submitting those things to God. Maybe you can't do it on your own. How do I submit something to God? That's a good question. I don't want to give you a bunch of spiritual platitudes like, well, you got to read your Bible and you got to, you should fast and do all those things. Listen. When you were baptized into the body of Christ, you were baptized into a new family. And it's a, it should be a place where you are equipped to be able to overcome, to be ministered to. And maybe your pastor is not equipped to do it. And so I would encourage you to find a, a Christian counselor or a Christian who understands the word that can come alongside you and hold you accountable, pray with you, intercede with you, get into the word with you, all these things, right? To help you walk in victory in your Christian walk. Let's continue on. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. That is awesome. Again, what does Romans 6 and 4 mean? Paul is introducing a collection of teachings about what happens when a person trusts in Christ for his or her salvation. In the previous verse, he wrote that Christians have been baptized into Christ Jesus and into his death. This seems to mean that through the Holy Spirit, a person who comes to faith in Christ experiences a spiritual baptism that takes us into Christ himself. We become so closely identified with him that God gives us credit for Christ's righteousness and accepts his death as a payment for our sin. And we talked about that. Jesus lived the perfect, obedient life on our behalf. So when you repent and you trust in Jesus Christ, it is as though that you live perfectly and obediently before God. And... Not only does he give us that righteousness, but he accepts the death of Christ on the cross as the payment for our sin. And he says, you are forgiven. You are made free. You're no longer a slave to sin. You have power over sin. Now let's continue on. Paul has also said that on, the spirit, on that spiritual level, we were baptized into Christ's death on the cross. Now he writes that we were also buried with him into death. Paul means to communicate that a real spiritual transaction took place when we were saved. On the spiritual level, we experienced death and burial with Christ. 
then God gloriously, gloriously raised us from that spiritual death, just as he raised Christ from physical death. The Father did all of this so that we will be able to walk in to experience for the first time spiritual life. This is a huge and mysterious idea, but it is at the heart of what it means to be a true, truly a Christian. Those who come to God through faith in Christ do not merely sign some documents and get their Jesus card. A real spiritual transformation, to, transformation takes place inside of us. We do not remain the same as we were before. We come to life for the first time. Ephesians 2 and 5 says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And God means for us to participate in this new life in a meaningful way. This is not only profound, but it helps to explain why a life of persistent and willful sin is incompatible with the profession of faith in Christ. Again, Galatians 5, 19 through 24. It lists the works of the flesh, the fruit of the spirit. And Paul says, and those who belong to Christ Jesus, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So you see, he lists the works of the flesh, which is our former life. And talks about the fruit of the spirit, which is our current life. And says those that, who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh. Those former things he was talking about, the sexual immorality, impurity, the sensuality, the idolatry, the witchcraft or sorcery, the enmity, the strife, the jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Again, it's not an exhaustive list, but it, most of us, if not all, when we read that list, we can see ourselves in some light in our former life. He says, those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those things no longer have dominion or power over you. Listen to what he says in 1 John 3, 6 through 9. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God. And you might ask the question, well, what does that look like? When you are a born-again Christian, your inward desire is to obey God. No more questions asked. End of story. If you have to ask yourself the question, or if someone is saying that they are saved, and it doesn't bother them to sin, they're okay with living in a habitual, unbroken pattern of sin, and it doesn't bother them. The only thing that bothers them is when they're held accountable. And even that, they will isolate themselves when they're not held accountable. Chances are they are never truly born again. And I know a lot of people want to make a mockery of the doctrine of justification by faith and eternal security. But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a lot of people out there that have a false assurance of salvation. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power. They are, they are those that profess Christ but they don't have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them. And again, that's another sermon for another time. We need to deal with the fact that there are many people 
in the church and many people who say that they are Christians and they are living a life of habitual sin. They'll go out, they could be, here's an illustration. A Christian who says that they're born again, or I, I won't even say a Christian because I want to I want to make this illustration right. Someone who says that affiliates himself as a Christian or professes to be a Christian, but then throughout the week has no regard for God, sins, and does whatever they want to do. Maybe they have a boyfriend that they're living with and having sex with outside of marriage or a girlfriend, or they have, maybe they're, they're into witchcraft, maybe they're into some kind of other form of idolatry, and they're not convicted about their sin. So they just keep doing it. And the only thing they'll, they'll really hang their salvation on is, well, I already said the sinner's prayer. I'm okay with, with God. God, God knows my heart. Who are you to judge me? Again, that's not evidence of a true believer. Another illustration of that type of person is someone that says, you know what, I'll just repent afterwards. Like repentance is some magic eraser in the sense of the word only. You don't really mean it from your heart. You just say it as a ritual. It's a platitude. And you just say it over and over. Oh, I repent. God, I repent for what I did. And then you go back out and do the same thing again. God, I repent for what I did. And then you go out and you do the same thing. That's not genuine repentance. When you repent, there is a change of mind. There's a renewing of the mind that leads to a change of character. You are conformed into the image of Christ. So what, what are some ways that I can respond to this message? Well, one of them is this. You fall in the category of either the antinomian or the legalist. And... For the legalist, you're trying real hard, you're, you're, you're burdened down, you don't think you're ever good enough. Some days when you're really doing real well, maybe you're in, you've been in the word, you've been in prayer, so you, you, you just seem like, yes, I, I know that God is pleased with me. But then there's other days where it's like, man, I didn't get into the word like I wanted to. I blew off at my wife. I, I, I yelled at my wife. I, yelled at my boss and I had a bad day and, you know, I don't think God is pleased with me. And you're so caught up in your performance. The good news of the gospel is this, that God doesn't look at you based upon what you do and do not do. You have forgiveness for all those areas in which you fall short, your anger, your outbursts of anger and all of that, right? We have Jesus Christ's death on the cross covered your past, present, and future sin. You can respond by taking your eyes off yourself and look at Christ. Because the Father looks at you as though you live that perfect life because of your identity in Christ. That as Christ 100% obeyed the Father, even unto death on the cross, that righteousness has been yours since you've placed your faith in Christ. But if you're on that, that antinomian side, you're on dangerous grounds. Because for you, all the death of Christ meant for you was that you would just have an empty profession of faith. You're not really changed. You're still living in that old, unbroken pattern of sin. And you're in danger of a great danger, even as Hebrew says, that if you reject the sacrifice of Christ, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. 
And so unless that righteousness has been given to you and you've been raised from the dead, where your insides are changed, the way you feel about God, the way you feel about sin, until you come to that place, the way that you need to respond to this message is that you would repent and wholeheartedly come to God so that your want to will be different, where you won't want those things anymore. The sin will no longer be your king, but Jesus will be your king, and you'll submit to him and yield to him, and day by day be conformed to the image of Christ. But there's a second way you can respond to this message. It's unfortunate because whether you're the antinomian or maybe you're someone that's somewhere in in the belief system that you have this belief that, well, I can serve God without being part of a church. And I believe in Christ. I know I'm a new creation in him, but I don't believe I got to be connected to a body. The second way you can respond is you need to understand that the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as some are in the manner of practice of doing. I want to encourage you to get into a Bible believing church, be connected somewhere. And if you would like some uh, recommendations, you can leave a comment in the section below, in the comment section below. And I could also help you find a Bible believing church that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way that it is meant to be proclaimed, a place where you can grow and be held accountable for your Christian faith. But then there's a third, there's a third response here. And maybe you're not born again. Maybe this is the first time you've heard the gospel message. It's true. When Jesus came to the earth as a man, he was fully man, fully God. He lived that perfect life for you, even unto death on the cross where he paid the penalty for your sin. He was buried and after three days he rose again for your justification. And all you have to do is repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ. And as you repent before God and you agree with God that you're a sinner and that Jesus' death and life, that Jesus' life was lived for you and that his death on the cross was the payment for your sin. And you trust in him with all of your heart. And you repent before God and say, God, forgive me a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. The Bible says if any man will come unto Christ, he will no wise cast out. If you repent of your sin, he is faithful and just enough to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I want to admonish you admonish you and to encourage you, repent before holy God. And if you've done that today, find a Bible believing church where you can be a part of and begin to grow and begin to understand the gospel. And if you want more information on the gospel, what it means to be a believer and be in a Bible believing church, you can also leave a comment in the comment section below and I will be glad to reach out to you and to speak with you and also to welcome you into the family of God. I am your host, Pastor Stephen Woods of Humble Beginnings Ministries, where loving God means loving his people. Until the next time, I appreciate you taking this time out. Like, subscribe, and share to this channel. I appreciate for all of you that do, and I will talk to you or see you on the next video.